Um, but basically, the idea is we've got this little town, and this town now wants to enter the 20th century, and they want to pave the pathways, pave the sidewalks in between each one of these houses. And each one of those uh, stones there is going to basically cost one unit of pavement. So in between here, uh, we've got a total of five units of pavement between those two houses. And in between here, we have a total of three units of pavement. Um, so the, the question is, is how can we pave this town so that there's a way to reach every house from every other house? It doesn't have to be the shortest way, but there, there should be some path in between them. In other words, we're going to get a connected graph. Every vertex is going to be connected into the graph somehow, but we want to use as little pavement as possible. So the first thing we might do here is convert this thing into a graph that we can actually like work with. So we've got a vertex here. A vertex here, here, here. Each one of the houses represents a vertex. Each one of these paths is an edge. And then we can write down the weights of each one of these edges. This is five, three, four, two, three, you know, and so forth. And then we can take away that picture, and we're left with a graph. So this, this picture here is a more abstract, general form of that graph. So let's just go over, kind of informally, how you would go about computing the minimal spanning tree. Now I want to put emphasis here on the word tree. The tree means that what you're going to get is a graph that has basically a root and then branches coming off of it. It's not necessarily going to be a continuous uh, path through the graph. It's probably going to have two or more branches, although it doesn't have to. But a tree means there's never going to be any cycles. For example, if we had put this edge and this edge into the tree, we would then not have to put this third one in. That would create a cycle and would also create a redundant edge that we don't need. So the whole purpose of this mineral spanning tree is just to hit all of the vertices but we won't necessarily use all the edges. In fact, we definitely won't use all the edges in this case. So the way we do this is we just pick a vertex to start at. Now, if you're a computer, you're probably either going to pick randomly, although random is a little difficult to do. You might just do something like pick the first, the first vertex in your list of vertices. And so in this case, it's just A. So we could just start there. We're going to hit all of the vertices, so it doesn't matter where we start. And then you look at all of the edges that are coming out of the vertices that you've uh, visited so far. In this case, it's just A. So we're going to look at the three edges that come out of A. And the weights are 4, 3, and 5. And then we just pick the lowest one, which is this one going to C. And then we just repeat the process over again. But this time, we look at all of the edges coming out of all of the vertices that we've included so far. So we've included A and C, so we're going to look at all the edges coming out of those two. And we're also not going to include any edges that go back to vertices that we've already included. So we're going to look at this 5, this 3, this 3, this 4, this 5, and this 4. Those are all the edges that we're going to consider. And then you just look at the weights and then pick the lowest one. If there is a tie, then you just break the tie either randomly or, you know, pick the first vertex in your list. So it looks like we do have a tie. We get a tie between this three and this three. So just either pick randomly or pick the vertex on, first vertex on your list, which would be B, just because it alphabetically comes before F. And then we just continue doing this over and over again until we have included all of the vertices in our tree. So we're going to look at all the edges coming out of all of the vertices that have been included so far, coming out of A, coming out of C, and coming out of B. But we're not going to look at that edge across the top between A and B because we've already included both A and B in the tree. So that edge across the top, even though it has a weight of 5, which is higher than all the others, we're not going to include it because it goes between two vertices that we've already visited. So we look at the lowest one. I think the lowest one is going to be this 
2 right here, that edge, and reach F. And then we just continue again. So we look at this edge, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Kind of see we have this ever expanding, what graph theorists call a frontier. So the frontier is kind of this edge, this, 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 um, path that's expanding through the graph. We're expanding our search area a little bit more each time. So we look for the lowest one. So we've got a four, a five, a four, a four, a three, a three, and a three. So there's three threes. Uh, so we just pick the lowest one, and if there's a tie, pick randomly. Let's go to D here. And then repeat again. Look at all the edges that are coming out of all of those vertices. Pick the lowest one, which I think is this two. And then repeat. Uh, looks like it's going to be this three right here. And then repeat. Okay, looks like there's a two. And then repeat. Let's see, this way, uh, this way, and this way. We got two threes to consider. So let's just pick the one that comes alphabetically first. I guess we'll come out of G. And then one more to do. So we'll look here, 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 and here. And then we've got a two. So let's go that way. And so now that we've touched all the vertices, we're done. And if we kind of imagine taking these, uh, this graph and picking it up by one of the vertices, let's say we pick it up by A. Then it goes to C. And then there it goes to B. And B branches to D and F. E goes to H, F goes to J, J goes to G, G goes to I, and then I goes to E. So you can see this tree structure, although it's not a very interesting tree. And then if we were to add up all the weights, three here, three, three, two, two, three, two, three, and two, if we add that all up, I believe we come up with a total of 23. So no matter which vertex you start at, you'll end up with the same minimal weight. So it's a pretty al easy algorithm to do. Um, this is called a greedy algorithm. In a greedy algorithm, the algorithm uh, goes stepwise through the process of solving the problem. And then every time there's a decision to make, and here the decision to make is which edge are we going to select next? Every time there's a decision to make, it picks the best one. So one thing a human might do in order to evaluate which edge is the best one, the human might like look ahead and go, okay, well, I'll pick this one because the next vertex will maybe have more choices available to me. Or maybe I'll pick this one because I can see that later on that's going to result in a better solution than some other one. But a greedy algorithm doesn't look ahead to see what choices will come later. It only looks at the information that it has available right now. Remember when we were drawing these edges out here uh, as, a, as this expanding frontier, those are the only things it considers. If it looks at these sets of edges here, it doesn't then go and look at this one or this one. It just looks only at the edges that it's supposed to look at at that moment and then picks the best one. So I'll say here, pick the best one based only on the immediate information. And the second thing a greedy algorithm doesn't do is it doesn't change its mind later on. It doesn't go through the algorithm and go, oh, actually, turns out that wasn't such a good choice. I should back up and change my mind. So as we went through this spanning tree algorithm, we just looked at the available edges that were coming out of the vertices that we had already included in the tree. And then we just picked the best one. I mean, just really kind of let it just like go through all the edges, sort them by weight, and then find the lowest one. That's all you got to do. So a greedy algorithm makes a decision and then sticks to it, as opposed to a backtracking algorithm, which does occasionally go back and change its mind. It's right, if you're solving a maze, you might go down one branch of the maze and realize, oh, that was a dead end. I need to back up and then try a different branch. That's a backtracking algorithm. But a greedy algorithm uh, looks at the available information, makes a decision, sticks with it, and then moves on to the next step.